morning, everybody. It's good to have you here today. I am calling this meeting to order. Uh, today, we will discuss the importance of the Environmental Protection Agency's EPA's Geographic Programs and National Estuary Program, the NEP. Uh, EPA's geographic programs help to identify and assist specific areas across the region, often across multiple states. Funding for these programs has been key to protecting and restoring some of the most cherished waterways in the nation. The Natural Estuary Program focuses on restoring and protecting 28 estuaries of national significance across the country. Estuaries and coastal areas are major economic drivers, accounting for some 28 million jobs, and these areas uh, are locations for ports and harbors. They need protection since impaired Estuaries can actually impact fishing and tourism revenues, cause costly damage from flooding, shoreline erosion, and damaged infrastructure. The Trump administration has proposed drastically cutting funding for the geographic programs and the NEP. Fortunately, Congress has restored funding for these important efforts. However, we need to renew our commitment to these programs and the protection of our nation's waters. Despite efforts by the state and in some places, voluntary efforts, progress has been slow, and we need to do more to protect and restore our nation's iconic waters. Congress needs to step up and provide funding and the appropriate authorities to EPA to restore these watersheds. That's why I appreciate the efforts of my colleagues to prioritize and fund these programs. Congresswoman Ludia has legislation to reauthorize and increase funding for the Chesapeake Bay program. Congressman Heck, has legislation to authorize the program for Puget Sound. Congresswoman Speer has legislation to address pollution issues in San Francisco Bay. And I expect that we will see later this Congress legislation to address the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the National Estuary Program. I thank my colleagues for stepping up to deal with these important water quality issues. Today's hearing will be an opportunity to hear about the current impairments, challenges, and recommendations for improving these waters. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on the value of our nation's water and estuaries to our country. Thank you for the witnesses for being here today and uh, all of you, pleased to see you. Thank you especially to Mr. Tom Ford, Executive Director of the uh, Bay Area Foundation who is here today to talk about Santa Monica Natural Estuary Program in Southern California, my area. I look forward to everybody's testimony and at this time I'm pleased to yield to my colleague Ranking member of our subcommittee, Mr. Westerman, for any thoughts he may have. Thank you, Chairwoman Napolitano, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, this subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on regional watershed programs and water bodies in areas that are part of EPA's National Estuary Program. Estuaries are unique and highly productive waters that are important to the ecological and economic basis of our nation. Fisheries, wildlife, recreation, and tourism are heavily dependent on healthy estuarine systems. For example, the Lake Pontchartrain Basin in Louisiana is home to 22 essential habitats, and its fisheries provide much of the seafood harvested along the Gulf Coast. Yet, despite their value, most estuaries in the United States have experienced stress from physical alteration and pollution, often resulting from development and rapid population growth in coastal areas. EPA's estuary program identifies nationally significant estuaries that are threatened by pollution, land development, and overuse, and provides grants that support development of management plans to protect and restore them. This program is designed to resolve issues at the watershed level, integrate science into the decision-making process, foster collaborative problem-solving, and involve the public. Unlike many other EPA and state programs that rely on conventional top-down regulatory measures to achieve environmental goals, the estuary program uses a framework that focuses on stakeholder involvement and interaction in tailoring solutions for problems that are specific to that region. This approach helps achieve protection and restoration goals. We need to be sure that the individual estuary programs continue to effectively implement their management plans for protecting and restoring estuaries. We also need to be careful not to add new layers of programmatic bureaucracy on any of the programs that could divert valuable resources away from actually implementing their plans. 
I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today and learning about the progress that's being made uh, in these estuaries and watersheds, and I yield back. Thank you, sir. The chair now recognizes Mr. DeFazio for uh, any statement he may have. I thank the chair. Thank you for holding uh, this extraordinarily uh, important hearing. Uh, we can approach the issue and from one of uh, many ways. Uh, you know, if you're really hard-hearted uh, and you really don't believe in protecting the environment and the costs of protecting uh, the environment or enhancing and restoring the environment, you can just look at the economic impact. Um, in uh, coastal states, uh, you know, it, the estuaries contribute $116 billion annually to the economy. Two million people are employed by ocean estuary-based tourism recreation. Eighty percent of the commercial and recreational fish caught depend on estuaries for part of their lives. Uh, so those are just a few of the reasons why we need to support these programs. A lot of talk about the tropical forest as the lungs of the world. Uh, well, the estuaries are the beating heart uh, of a healthy uh, marine uh, ocean uh, system. And so, uh, you know, I'm pleased uh, that we're here today. I mean, there's been, the Chesapeake has made scant progress, unfortunately, uh, and needs more attention. Great Lakes, uh, we have uh, ongoing issues. Uh, the uh, Puget Sound, uh, in particular, down in the southern part of the Sound, uh, has issues. They, I was up there for uh, some meetings, I think it was the year before last. They made me an honorary member of the Puget Sound Caucus. Of course, I represent Oregon. I have critical estuaries in my district, which are in much better shape, much less known. Uh, and of course, we did add the Columbia River uh, Basin to the list of geographic programs in, in 16. So we, um, we've at least um, begun to focus on the problems, uh, but a heck of a lot more work needs to be done, and that's why we're here today. And I thank the gentlelady for holding the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Fascio. The next I'll recognize Mr. Sam Gra Mr. Garrett Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I want to thank you all for, for hosting this hearing. Uh, these are some of the most important estuaries that our nation has to offer that are represented here on the panel today, but I'm especially excited to introduce uh, Ms. Christy Trail from Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. Um, she, uh, she's a, a great uh, asset to the state of Louisiana, the patri the Pontchartrain Basin Foundation is a, is a critical organization. Uh, I, I remind this committee often that we drain from Montana to New York to uh, three Canadian provinces that all drain down through our area. Right now we're seeing record time of flood stage on the Mississippi River system. We normally open the Bonacary Spillway that flows through uh, uh, Lake Pontchartrain once every 10 years. We've opened it four times in the last four years. Um, uh, Congressman Rodney Davis from Illinois calls Louisiana his sewage treatment plant. Um, I'm not sure that's a compliment, but um, uh, the bottom line is, is that all of this development and everything that happens in the upper basin comes down and affects our state. And while I know that everyone has their challenges in managing these estuaries, uh, Ms. Trail, uh, environmental engineer, LSU grad, um, and, and much corporate work experience in the engineering field is, uh, again, a great asset. The organization is fantastic, and they have some incredible challenges dealing with the complexity of the ecosystem. So. Appreciate you inviting her and allowing her to be here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Graves. I ask unanimous consent that the following statements be made part of today's hearing record. From Representative Jackie Spears, San Francisco Bay, Representative Elaine Luria, Chesapeake Bay, Michigan Governor Whitmer, Great Lakes, Sheboygan County, Wisconsin, Great Lakes, Healing Our Waters, Great Lakes Coalition, and Great Lakes, Great Lakes Commission of the Great Lakes. Any objections? So ordered. Uh, we will proceed to hear from our witnesses who are going to be testifying today. Uh, thank you for being here and welcome. We have Secretary Preston Cole with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Supervisor Dave Pine with San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, Ms. Laura Blackmore, Executive Director of Puget Sound Partnership, Mr. William C. Baker, President of Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, since Mr. Grace has already introduced Ms. Christy Trill, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Ruda, to introduce the witness, uh, Mr. Tom Ford, Director of Santa Monica Bay Estuary Program. Thank you, Chairwoman. I am pleased to introduce Tom Ford, the Executive Director of the Santa Monica Bay National Estuary Program and the Bay Foundation. Tom has been engaged in the study and restoration of kelp forest since he first moved to LA in the 1990s, and his efforts to promote fisheries 
and increased coastal resilience has been internationally recognized. His work helps ensure that residents and visitors from around the world are able to enjoy and benefit from the Santa Monica Bay's over 55 miles of coastline that contains some of the world's most loved beaches. Estuaries like the Santa Monica Bay play an important role in coastal economies, habitat protection, and as key buffer zones for coastal communities and inland waterways, especially in the wake of continued sea level rise, increasingly severe storm surges, and dangerous flooding. I commend Tom's longstanding commitment to restoring, preserving, and protecting and enhancing the Santa Monica Bay National Estuary, and I appreciate the many hours that he's dedicated to ensuring a high quality of life for the approximately 5,000 species and over 4 million people that call the Santa Monica Bay and its watershed home. Southern California is better off for his continued research, critical pollution and ecological monitoring and advocacy work, and I'm grateful for his participation in today's hearing. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ruda. Without objection, your prepared statements will be entered into the record and all witnesses are asked to limit your remarks to five minutes. Mr. Cole, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm coming to you on the heels uh, of the Great Lakes and uh, Governors and the Premier's Conference held in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and where Governor Tony Evers is the chair of that group, and certainly I'm representing here, him here today from the great state of Wisconsin. Chairwoman Napolitano, ranking members, uh, Bruce Westerman and Mr. DeFazio, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of the governor of Wisconsin, Tony Evers, and the eight Great Lakes states. As you've seen in my written testimony, the Great Lakes, Superior, Huron, Michigan, Ontario, and Erie are a national treasure with 30 million Americans depending on them for clean, fresh water. Sometimes referred to as the nation's fourth coast, the Great Lakes are a breathtaking place to watch a sunrise or the perfect backdrop for making memories. But our Great Lakes are more than just nice to look at. These are waters that are the largest source of fresh water on the planet, a lifeline for millions of people. They provide a backbone for a $6 trillion regional economy, making it the third largest regional economy in the world. And they generate more than 1.5 million jobs and $60 billion in wages each year, which is why protecting and restoring these irreplaceable waters is a nonpartisan priority for the people in the Great Lakes region. Wisconsin is part of this region and is home to an abundance of natural resources, including our precious waters. With more than 1,000 miles of shoreline, the Great Lakes have a profound effect on Wisconsin's environment, our economy, our culture, and our quality of life. To give you an idea of the impact of Wisconsin, consider this. More than 1.6 million Wisconsinites get their drinking water from Lake Michigan or Lake Superior. Nearly 50% of the state's gross domestic product originates in coastal counties. More than $7 billion in cargo moves through Wisconsin's ports each year, contributing to $1.1 billion of business revenue and generating $241 million in taxes. In Wisconsin, the Great Lakes and rivers that feed them have a long history as important centers of trade and industry. But as our cities grew, these economic hubs Rivers and harbors were polluted. Vital fish and wildlife habitats were lost. Polluted runoff from excess nutrients has caused harmful algal blooms from Green Bay to Lake Erie. And now these impacts are keeping us from experiencing these waters in their fullest potential. But all is not lost. In 2010, Congress led to establish the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative which is providing an enormous boost for the projects that restore our waters. For the last eight years, more than $380 million in federal funding through GLRI has made over 500 projects possible throughout Wisconsin's and the Great Lakes Basin. In many cases, the GLRI funds are leveraged with state funds, local units of government, and private funding. 
This cost sharing allows big ticket products, projects to be accomplished that would be simply too expensive for any one entity to pay for alone. In Wisconsin, the GLRI is helping protect citizens and our natural resources. For example, in the Milwaukee Estuary of Concern, more than 31 million of GLRI funds were matched with 12 million of Wisconsin state funds to remove 119,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment from the Milwaukee estuary near the heart of the city. The end result was a removal of more than 11,000 pounds of toxic PCBs from rivers that flow into Lake Michigan. It's about an hour's ride north of Milwaukee along the lake is a Sheboygan River area of concern where more than 50 million of GLRI funds were matched by 33 million of state funds to remove 300,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment. As a result, 39,000 pounds of toxic PCBs were removed, and yet thousands of acres of wildlife habitat was restored. The Demonstration Farms Network in the Lower Fox River Basin in northeastern Wisconsin is yet another shining example of the important contribution that GLRI is making towards enhancing Wisconsin's environment and our economy. Through this effort, which is led by the NRCS, with support from the state and county conservation agencies, farmers are demonstrating cutting-edge management practices and sharing valuable lessons learned with their peers from how to improve soil health to reducing nutrient runoff into Lake Michigan. Yes, ma'am. However, serious threats still remain. Cutting restoration funding will only make projects harder and more expensive. We see the federal government as a partner in our shared goal of healing the lakes through the world's largest freshwater projects. Without your help, there will be trouble in the water. To be candid, at a time when many citizens are concerned about the federal government will do for them or to them, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is a shining example of what the federal government is doing much, for sir. them. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Pine. The mic. Thank you. So good morning. It's a privilege to testify before this committee today. San Francisco Bay is an iconic water second to none. It is the West Coast's largest estuary and drains water from approximately 40% of California. Despite being surrounded by over 7 million people, San Francisco Bay is an ecological hotspot with more than 100 endangered species. The bay provides an abundance of recreational opportunities including the 365-mile San Francisco Bay Trail. And commercially, the bay contains six ports, is a major driver of the tourism industry, and offers an inviting backdrop for some of the largest and best-known companies in the world, which are located on its shoreline. So in short, San Francisco Bay is an ecological, commercial, and recreational marvel. Since the gold rush, there have been three chapters in the bay's evolution degradation, preservation, and now restoration. Until the early 1960s, the bay was drastically altered by urbanization, salt production, agricultural uses that reduced the bay size by one third and destroyed about 80% of the bay's tidal wetlands. With the birth of the environmental movement, the second chapter of the bay's evolution began as we worked to preserve the bay and reduce pollution and bay fill. We've now embarked on a new chapter for the Bay where we are enhancing and restoring this remarkable natural asset for the benefit of both people and wildlife. In 1999, scientists published the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals, calling for the creation of 100,000 acres of healthy tidal wetlands. And tidal wetlands are virtually, are vitally important to the Bay's ecosystem. They trap polluted runoff and they also provide natural protection against flooding and sea level rise. Starting from about 30,000 acres of original wetlands, we've restored or are in the process of restoring about 18,000 additional acres. But with approximately 44,000 acres yet to restore, much remains to be done. A few notable milestones. In 2003, 
15,000 acres of South Bay salt ponds were purchased and are now being restored. And this is the largest restoration project in the country west of the Mississippi. In 2008, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority was created to raise and allocate local funding for restoration. In June 2016, Measure AA, a 20-year, $12 parcel tax, was passed by 70% of the voters across all nine Bay Area counties. Measure AA provides about $25 million annually, or $500 million over 20 years to fund restoration projects. And in 2018, we initiated the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team to expedite and coordinate permitting across the six state and federal agencies. But against this positive backdrop, in 2015, scientists issued a very serious warning and wake-up call. They reported that without accelerating the pace of wetland restoration, existing sites that could be restored will be drowned by the rising bay waters. They emphasized that tidal marshes established by 2030, just 11 years away, are more likely to flourish. And that's because at a gradual rate of sea level rise, uh, such as what we're experiencing now, marshes can trap sediment and keep up as sea level rise accelerates. So it's clear we're in a race against time. While many building blocks are in place to restore the bay, we are hampered by inadequate federal funding. Over the last 10 years, only 28% of the funds spent on acquisition and restoration of the bay lands were from federal sources. And now this is despite the fact that much of the restoration has involved property owned by the federal government. Traditionally, federal funding for other major estuaries has dwarfed the amounts that the San Francisco Bay has received. The EPA administered San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Program provides only $5 million annually. That is why the legislation introduced by Congresswoman Jackie Speer, H.R. 1132, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Act, is so timely and important. Her bill would authorize up to $25 million annually to the EPA to award grants to bay conservation and restoration projects. It would also establish a San Francisco Bay program office within the EPA. In conclusion, to restore the bay, we have put in place a comprehensive science-based uh, plan, a 20-year local funding source through Measure AA, and a collaborative partnership to expedite permitting. But with sea level rise accelerating, we have limited time to complete the remaining restoration work that is needed. The missing ingredient is the necessary federal funding to complement our local efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pine. Uh, next, we have Ms. Laura Blackmore, please. Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Westerman, Chair DeFazio, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today. On behalf of my organization and our hundreds of partners, thank you for convening this important hearing to talk about protecting and restoring America's iconic waters, including my home, Puget Sound. Puget Sound is a beautiful place, and it's also a complex one, with 16 major rivers, 20 federally recognized tribes, four and a half million people, and the headquarters of 11 Fortune 500 companies. Our economy is roaring, and the natural beauty of Puget Sound and the recreational opportunities it offers help our businesses attract top talent. I would welcome the opportunity to host you or your staff for an up-close look at this breathtaking and energizing place. Unfortunately, Puget Sound is also slowly dying. Southern resident orcas, Chinook salmon, and steelhead are all listed under the Endangered Species Act. We continue to pollute our waterways and our shellfish beds, and habitat degradation outpaces restoration. The people of Washington State realized something was wrong in the early 2000s. A groundswell of public support led then Governor Gregoire to establish a task force which recommended the creation of the Puget Sound Partnership as a state agency in 2007. Congress at that time also included Puget Sound in the National Estuary Program. This highly effective program, which we will hear more about in a few moments from my counterpart, Tom Ford, charges us with developing and implementing a collaborative, non-regulatory blueprint for restoring and protecting this iconic water body. In Puget Sound, we call this blueprint the Action Agenda. Nothing tells the story of Puget Sound more profoundly than last summer's tragic loss of the newborn calf of Telequa, or J35, a southern resident orca. 
She grieved over the body of her dead calf for 17 days, and her pod accompanied her as she swam 1,000 miles through Canadian and U.S. waters of the Salish Sea with her calf's body. The world watched Tilakwa suffer, and now the world watches us. This year, Washington state legislators passed significant policy and budget bills aimed at orca recovery. Because of their bold actions, we have hope that we will stave off extinction for the southern resident orcas. But state resources alone are not enough. Federal funding and cooperation is crucial. Here's why. Scientists say that we can still recover Puget Sound, but only if we act boldly now. We know what we need to do. The primary barriers between us and more food for orcas, clean and sufficient water for people and fish, sustainable working lands and harvestable shellfish are funding and political fortitude. Our data show that the funding received to recover Puget Sound and its salmon falls woefully short of the need. The funding gap for the 2016-2018 action agenda was 73%, and the funding gap for salmon recovery is 84%. Our monitoring shows that at these funding levels, we're barely holding our ground, if not managing decline of the ecosystem. We cannot wait any longer to fully fund habitat restoration and salmon recovery in Puget Sound. The single greatest step we could take to ensure a durable, systematic, and science-based effort for Puget Sound recovery is to fully fund the implementation of these programs. H.R. 2247, the Promoting United Government Efforts to Save Our Sound, or Puget SOS, Act, introduced by Congressman Heck and Kilmer this year, would authorize up to $50 million in funding for Puget Sound recovery, a significant and very welcome jump from the $28 million we've been appropriated over the last several years. It also would align federal agency brain power and resources. These are tremendous assets. Ensuring they're coordinated, setting goals, and holding each other accountable will help increase their effectiveness and provide yet another boost to Puget Sound recovery. Establishing the Puget Sound Program Office at EPA and requiring a federal task force promises that these goals will be met. Passing the Puget SOS bill would demonstrate to the nation that Puget Sound is vital to the economic, cultural, and environmental security of the United States. By investing significantly in the health and well-being of Puget Sound, Federal decision makers demonstrate that Puget Sound is worth saving and is of critical importance to the national well-being. Washington State, our tribes, local governments, nonprofits, and the private sector are committed to success. We greatly appreciate the commitment of this subcommittee to ensuring that the federal government is a viable, willing partner in this race against time. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Blackport, and thank you for staying within the limit. Uh, Mr. Baker, you're on. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Napolitano, Ranking Member Westerman, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Will Baker. I've been president of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for 37 years of the organization's 52-year history. Our mission is to protect and restore the bay and its rivers. The Chesapeake is America's largest estuary. When colonial settlers arrived more than 400 years ago, the water was pristine. 4,400 Native Americans had little impact on the 64,000 square mile watershed. Today, there are 19 million of us, and we have had a significant and sadly negative impact. By 1980, the Bay was on life support. In a 1982 banner headline in the Baltimore Sun, it read in its entirety, Bay is dying, scientists warn. A bipartisan groundswell of concern arose, and in 1984, in his State of the Union message, Ronald Reagan called for the federal government to help save this national treasure. Congress did its part. In 1987, the Chesapeake Bay program was created it includes multiple federal agencies, and EPA is the lead. Most basically, it helps to ensure that the six states and the District of Columbia, all in the watershed, work together. Also in that year, 1987, the states and federal agencies signed an agreement to cut nitrogen and phosphorus pollution by 40 percent by the year 2000. That goal was missed by a lot. So the deadline was simply extended 10 years to 2010. 
And yet by 2008, it was obvious to all involved that they, it too would be missed. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation sued EPA in a last ditch effort to achieve an enforceable plan. Fortunately, Administrator Lisa Jackson negotiated a settlement with us. EPA agreed to develop what is now known as the landmark Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. It's been a game changer. Each jurisdiction has agreed to reduce its share of the pollution and to do it in two-year incremental and reportable increments, milestones they're called, toward the 2025 deadline. And EPA agreed to be the referee and to impose penalties if a state failed to meet its milestone targets. Here's the good news. It's working. 36 years after that headline I just referenced, the same paper wrote a new headline. Quote, scientists say they're confident Chesapeake health is significantly improving in 36 years. The Chesapeake Bay program is the glue that holds this multi-state restoration effort together. The federal government is the one jurisdiction which can do what science says must be done to treat the bay and all of its rivers as a single ecological system. Experts agree around the world, and believe me, it is around the world, that this is perhaps our best and last chance to save the Bay. The Bay program uses science proactively. It provides grants to reduce pollution, and it monitors progress. But we're not done. The recovery is fragile. Last year, we had 80 inches of rain, twice the normal, and it delivered so much pollution that scientists believe we may see some of the worst levels of low dissolved oxygen this year in decades. Let's hope that such intense storm events are not the new normal under climate change, especially as regulatory rollbacks threaten progress. While most of the Bay States are on track, I'm sorry to report that Pennsylvania is way behind, and it's a critically important state. If the Bay is to be saved, EPA must hold Pennsylvania accountable. I will conclude. The Chesapeake Bay Clean Water Blueprint is an international model. The Bay program is essential, and it must be fully funded. We thank you for the bipartisan support here in the House to do just that. Now it's on to the Senate. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Baker. I don't know if you're aware, but yesterday uh, there was an article in the Washington Times that stated uh, scientists predict record dead zone in Chesapeake Bay. Some ecologists at University of Maryland are worried that a large spot of low oxygen in the Chesapeake Bay could harm the state's seafood industry. Scientists from Maryland and the University of Michigan said they are predicting a two-mile swath of low to no oxygen in the bay making it one of the largest dead zones in nearly 20 years. That was yesterday. Yes. So I think you are right. And, and this is after five or six years of that dead zone going down to almost zero. So. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Christy, you, you're, Christy Trail, th please uh, proceed. Thank you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony to you today as well. This testimony describes some history on our environmental organization and why funding for the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Restoration Program, or PRP for short, is vital to maintaining the successes we have had. It is worth noting that the results achieved and long-term impact of our work have been largely based on the continuity of effort, which is why programmatic funding is so important. For those of you not familiar with Lake Pontchartrain, here are a few details. The lake forms the northern boundary of the greater New Orleans area and is crossed by the longest continuous bridge over open water in the world, more than 24 miles in length. Lake Pontchartrain and its surrounding lands and waters encompass 10,000 square miles. It is part of one of the largest estuaries in the country, and it interacts directly with the Gulf of Mexico. When the Mississippi River approaches flood stage, as it has been this year for several months, 
Part of its flow is diverted across a flood control structure operated by the Army Corps of Engineers called the Bonnie Carey Spillway. Thus, fresh water, river water flows into Lake Pontchartrain when it is opened. In 2019, for the first time ever, the spillway has been opened twice, with the second opening continuing now. The Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation was established 30 years ago in 1989 in response to environmental concerns voiced across Southeast Louisiana. In 2000, Congress established the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Restoration Program to restore the ecological health of the basin by developing and funding restoration projects and related scientific and public education programs. Shortly after PRP was authorized, LPBF established our in-depth water quality monitoring program. Within just a few years of the PRP funding, LPBF worked with the state of Louisiana and the US EPA to have the lake removed from the impaired water bodies list under the Clean Water Act 303D. Southeast Louisiana's natural resources and built infrastructure are of national importance. We know from past hurricanes and major oil spills that interruptions to our state's workforce alter the nation's economy. Conditions in Southeast Louisiana affect our state's pivotal roles in energy supply for the New England states. For tourism, $47 million in 2017, the estuary that supports the seafood industry and sportsman's paradise, and waterborne commerce through the Port of New Orleans. All of these systems hinge on continued and increased preservation, restoration, and protection efforts benefiting Lake Pontchartrain, its estuary, and the coastal ecosystem in Southeast Louisiana. With our funding, in 2013, LPBF established a small museum inside the restored New Basin Canal Lighthouse in New Orleans. Tourists, school children, lighthouse aficionados, and others can visit to learn about the region's history and ecology and LPBF's successes. Since the lighthouse opened, more than 50,000 youth and adults have toured its exhibits. Our water quality monitoring program has provided timely scientific analysis and broad dissemination of results to allow citizens to make informed decisions about enjoying the lake for fishing, swimming, and other recreational activities. The most important component of this effort is maintaining a continuous data set. We have been sampling the basin continuously every week for 18 years, and we do not want to interrupt that data set due to a lag in funding. Additionally, to address the need posed by episodic problems concerning water quality and public health, we conduct needed analyses and provide information for situations such as the Mississippi River when it flows into the lake from the Bonnie Carey Spillway, creating potentially toxic algal blooms, when oil rigs explode, when sewage spills, or when tropical storms or hurricanes hit our region. In 2006, LPBF created the Multiple Lines of Defense Strategy. The lines of defense are both man-made and natural and include barrier islands, sounds, marshes, natural ridges, man-made ridges, floodgates, levees, pump stations, elevated homes and businesses, and evacuation routes. Restoring targeted habitat sites, such as swamps and marshes, is integral to recreating a self-sustaining coast and permanent storm protection for coastal communities. PRP funding comprises a critical portion of our total budget though it has decreased significantly over the years. And reauthorization allows us to continue our many restoration efforts. Although the lake and its resources have made a tremendous comeback, Lake Pontchartrain and its surrounding area continue to face environmental challenges. All across the United States, the protection of rivers, streams, lake bays, and adjacent lands can create jobs, protect fisheries relied upon by the fishing industry, protect food sources, enhance property values, decrease local government expenditures, and provide recreational opportunities. With congressional support, we can continue this great work for years to come, leaving behind a legacy of clean water, a strong economy, and a prosperous region. It is for this reason we ask for reauthorization of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trail. Uh, we move on to Mr. Ford. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Chairwoman Napolitano. Is your uh, mic on? Try that again. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here uh, this morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Napolitano, Ranking Member Westerman, Ms. Uh, Representative DeFazio, and Mr. Rauta, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I want to thank you all, in addition, for so capably um, contextualizing exactly what we're looking at here today. Uh, the livelihood of many of coastal America's regions, 
uh, the importance of the health and rights of clean water and clean air, uh, with which I don't know how we can proceed forward. Um, I, I think when I reflect on this, because we've heard many stats and numbers today, um, that what this comes down to is that decades ago, leadership within the United States House of Representatives said we need to take on these issues. They are of national importance. It is our responsibility. And I can tell you, and I think that the f five folks that spoke right here before me today understand um, that without the federal government's involvement, we can't effectively make this work on the local or state level. And that we do this not with uh, regulations and that top-down approach that Mr. Westerman uh, spoke to, but we do that with cooperation, um, sitting around the table. I, I like to say that you know our interaction with our folks starts with, hello, how are you? My name is Tom Ford, and I'm here to help. Uh, and because we are locally based um, and we work with these people, we are trusted. We have those relationships, and we will also be there um, for the long run. So they turn to us for leadership. They turn to us for a steady hand uh, and support at a time when things seem quite unsteady uh, for many of us. Uh, so it is time again for you to display that leadership. And although I am, I am very proud of all of the accomplishments that come around this table, I'm very thankful that Will Baker is here today to speak about the Chesapeake Bay program, which I think became the model for how we should move forward as an NEP program. Uh, and albeit he's had his successes, he recognizes that there's no end day where you ring the bell and you walk home, um, the planet is dynamic, our needs of it are dynamic, um, the challenges that we face are ongoing. So um, thank you for the support that we've received over these many decades. That said, the challenges we face are a bit daunting at times. And the funding that we receive right now, albeit very helpful, um, it's, it's insufficient. I think, for us to face the challenges of our growing population, uh, to protect our shorelines, to protect our coasts, to protect our economies, to protect all those iconic animals and ecosystems uh, that we all cherish and that provide tourism opportunities, recreational opportunities, and a quality of life that I think we recognize attracts roughly 40% of the population of this United States to those shores. Uh, so what do we face? We face erosion sea level rise, increased storminess. We have an opportunity to preserve our fisheries, our tourism, our public and our private infrastructure. Um, and all along the way, what we do is create a more resilient and robust economy and ecosystem that serves us all in the future. So uh, to quote uh, Ronald Reagan's 1984 State of the Union address, that protecting the environment isn't a bipartisan or partisan issue, it's just common sense. Um, so I, I, I'll take his lead on that one. Um, I think the, uh, I could sit here and tell you in detail about all the challenges and I'd love to brag about all the progress we've made in Southern California. But to summarize this, I'm on the Atlantic seaboard, I'm in the Gulf of Mexico, I'm on the West Coast or I'm in Puerto Rico and every single one of the 28 national estuary programs could come in here and fill a day's worth of your time explaining to you the successes and the challenges that we've had and that we continue to face. Um, the wonderful thing that I think we find is that we have leveraged uh, the financial contributions from the federal government 19 to 1. Uh, on average, um, when my programs had an especially banner year, we were up at 58 to 1. So we know how to put that money to effective use. Uh, the efficiencies that we find therein um, are because of this, again, local program, locally based from the community up, so that when the money finally arrives and the project and the shovels are ready to go, everybody is engaged. They've informed it. Our leadership are informed, um, and our programs move forward with very little resistance. Um, I think that that right there is one, perhaps one of the greatest assets that we can provide to you today. I thank you for your time once again, and I'm here to answer any questions that I may be able to. Thank you so very much for your testimony, and uh, we welcome all of your testimony. Uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, questions that member may have uh, from witnesses, and uh, we will use the timer to allow five minutes of questions for each member. If there are additional questions, we w might have a second round if necessary. Uh, and I will start with the questioning. And to all witnesses, it sounds like most of you had uh, uh, your partnerships working very well. 
and that's admirable. I wish we could do that here. Uh, but uh, some contend that the bureaucracy leads to inefficiency in managing and implementing restoration, and it creates duplicative effort across the watershed. Uh, do you find this as a challenge uh, of having multiple jurisdictions with different priorities? And how do you create and implement a comprehensive ecosystem, a restoration plan for the entire watershed? Uh, anybody? I'll, I'll jump in, and thank you for the question. Um, you had mentioned the, the notion that in the Wisconsin way, we get past this notion of uh, the right, the left, the middle. It is recognition that there is a problem. Once that recognition has been realized, it's rolling up your sleeves and those, those partnerships become vital. We've learned through a series of, of ups and downs and wrong paths as to how to go about leveraging the money from local jurisdictions, county jurisdictions, state jurisdictions, as well as federal monies as well. And the emphasis certainly is environment, but I'd be remiss not to tell you that the economic impact of all of this is very important for the folks who live there. As I mentioned uh, briefly in my testimony, we have uh, put in place um, a new approach to deal with what can be extremely time consuming and expensive and often onerous regulatory processes to allow restoration work to go forward. Um, it's not uncommon for the permitting process to take uh, over, over three years and uh, that drives up, up, up costs and uh, hampers our abilities to do restoration. So uh, we have uh, found funding of about 1.2 million a year to actually um, uh, employ staff from six agencies that are committed to working together and actually sitting in the same room a couple of days a week so that uh, permits can be looked at in a more coordinated way and uh, expedite the, 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 that process. They're also charged with looking at the regulatory landscape and looking for areas that can be updated because many of our processes and regulations were put in place, of course, long before climate change and uh, need, need to reflect the new realities. Yeah, no, per perhaps I could respond to that as well. Um, I, I don't find duplicative uh, efforts uh, and the benefit of our Federal link through the US EPA helps us interact with, uh, with those sister agencies, all of which provide very discernible services to us in Southern California. From the US Geological Survey to National Parks to NOAA to National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, there's, there's talents and charges resident in all of that, and we need those information from them in order to actually enable and inform our plans and then to actually monitor and evaluate our success from all of them. Uh, I would think that uh, for many of these programs also, and um, we, we heard it from, from Will, we heard it from Laura, these folks are working in multiple states. Um, I don't think that there, anybody wants a different endpoint, uh, but without that federal lens on this, there's very little way a state, I think, or a local government could even try to approach it. Um, so it's intrinsic that we need it. Thank you very much. Uh, to all the witnesses, I have a concern with invasive species. You uh, have mentioned that as part of the problem and uh, how is your region addressing it? I know there was a big uh, push to um, eradicate the quagga mussels and of course the, the carp, but uh, I was wondering if any of you have found a way to uh, deal with it. Certainly, Madam Chair. Um, again, on the heels of the Great Lakes governors and the Canadian premiers, this was item number one on the list the associated problems with the electronic fence to allow and stop the, I'm on, hello? Yes. To stop the Asian carp. Again, it was sheer recognition that we all had skin in the game. And state of Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin will all be teeing up dollars and funding to ensure that the Asian carp uh, stays in its place. Again, the sheer recognition that that is a problem and you have the governors, the leaders of each state recognizing uh, working together. They're working together. And I would say um, in Puget Sound, we have discovered an invasion of European green crabs, but we are just at the very beginning of that. So we are working, the state of Washington is working with the local tribes and the local governments to and citizen volunteers to go out and actually find all the baby crabs and get rid of them before they can breed. Very fine. 
Uh, thank you very much to you uh, all, and I recognize Mr. Westerman for his, his questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, again, thank you to the witnesses. Um, I've visited many of the estuaries that are represented at the, at the table today, truly remarkable places. Uh, Ms. Trail, as uh, my friend from Louisiana introduced you, I believe he said you were a, you're an engineer, and uh, he had to make sure that he put in a graduate of LSU. But um, I'm an engineer as well, and I know that you know, throughout history we've tried to, to, to tame the outdoors, if you will, using concrete and levees and and floodgates and all of those things. And I'm often reminded of uh, a quote by Mark Twain, who he said, one who knows the Mississippi will promptly aver, not aloud, but to himself, that 10,000 river commissions with the minds of the world at their back cannot tame that lawless stream, cannot curb it or confine it, cannot say to it, go here or go there and make it obey, cannot save a shore which it has sentenced, cannot bar its path with an obstruction which it will not tear down, dance over, and laugh at. So um, I find it interesting that you're an engineer doing the, the work that you're doing. And I know a lot of the things that I read talk about, um, you know, instead of trying to just brute force uh, contain nature, we're starting to use more natural designs to help work with nature. And could you talk a little bit about um, what's happening in Lake Pontchartrain with natural designs. And I'd really like to open that up to the rest of the, the panel too. I know with the, the record flooding we're having now from, from my state in Arkansas and all areas of the Mississippi River, there's a lot of Mississippi River water being diverted into Lake Pontchartrain that could uh, you know, upset the, uh, the ecosystem there for quite a while. But can you elaborate on natural designs a little bit more? Absolutely, thank you. Um, and I am a proud LSU graduate of civil engineering, so thank you for reaffirming that. Um, as I talked about in my testimony, uh, we uh, created the multiple lines of defense strategy shortly after Hurricane Katrina. And what we like to do is communicate storm surge protection for communities as a system, that we need both the natural barriers and the man-made barriers to work together. So in South Louisiana, we talk a lot about levees. But it's important to remind folks that we're not just going to build a bigger levee our way out of this situation with subsidence and sea level rise, that we absolutely have to have those natural barriers ahead of the man-made barriers to make the system all work together, all components together. And a big component of that is not just barrier islands, but also having marshes and swamps with those trees that buffer wave action and wind action to protect those man-made barriers. Now, there's been a lot of work with cypress swamps reestablishing cypress swamps. Are there things that could be done you know, upstream in the watershed that would um, you know, possibly help you out from having to take all that excess flow from the Mississippi River in the future? Are there, are there projects we could do maybe out of the estuary that would benefit the estuary? Um, and thank you for asking that. You know, we were successful in 2009 in closing a man-made structure that entered um, into Lake Pontchartrain. It was called the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. Um, it was constructed for navigation purposes, but what it did at the time was allow extra salt water to enter our estuary, which prevented trees from growing all around the perimeter of the lake. With the closure of that in 2009, we've seen great success in the growth of trees all around Lake Pontchartrain. So we have planted trees all around the area to restore a lot of the land bridges surrounding South Louisiana. Uh, we've planted about 60,000 trees in the past five years, and with our work, uh, we don't just go plant the trees, we monitor them every year, and we've had a great success rate of those trees staying in place. This is unprecedented situation, though, with the Mississippi River flowing into Lake Pontchartrain for such a long period of time this year, but we'll be out there monitoring to see what effects it does have on the trees. We don't yet know if it will have a negative effect. It's short term, the lake tends to be pretty resilient, and it will bounce back, um, so we'll be monitoring to see the effects of those trees. Another program that we're looking to do to uh, increase the number of trees that we can plant each year is that we recognize manually planting trees is labor intensive. We get a lot of great volunteers out there to do it. We work with the community to do it, but it takes us a long time to get those trees in the ground. So if we keep doing it at the pace that we are doing it, it's gonna take us 1,000 years to plant the trees we need to plant. So we're looking at innovative technologies to get more trees in the ground with things like aerial seeding. Good. Would, would anybody else like to? Yes, sir. 
Mr. Westman, I just want to thank you so much for that question and acknowledging the value of looking at what is called green infrastructure as a way to supplement hard infrastructure. It's happening, I think I can confidently say, across all of our various uh, systems. It really is important because it's less expensive, more effective, and it's putting back what we have taken away over the centuries. So thank you very much. You, you hit the nail on the head. Ditto. <laughs> yeah, and well I, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that as well, because I think it's, this is uh, an interesting and new uh, transformation in, in the Los Angeles region where I work, and that is that our beaches, which we love, and uh, I think that's it's like imagining New York without pizza. You can't have L.A. without a beach. Um, and what we've now said is, you know what, the beach that we've had there isn't the beach that used to be there. We're putting that beach back. It is. It's affordable. Um, we're engaging the community and the stakeholders. Um, a woman that showed up at a public meeting and said, I don't like this. I don't want you messing around in front of my house. By the time we were done talking, she was like, I want you to put that ribbon of life in front of my home so that I can sleep here knowing that I'm not going to face a storm that's going to come up and flood my, my property. Uh, so the, the opportunities are many. Um, but again, to reinforce, I think, where we've been uh, earlier today, you know, we're, we're receiving 26.5 million right now for the National Estuary Program. You guys and your predecessors reauthorized us not too many years ago to get us up to around 35. We'd love to see that type of support and, and those, those dollar values come out of, the, out of the proceedings this year. And if I might, might just add, in San Francisco Bay, just a few weeks ago, um, the San Francisco Estuary Institute in a planning group called SPUR released the San Francisco Bay Eco Atlas. And it looked at all the shorelines around San Francisco Bay and uh, examine nature-based solutions. Tidal wetlands, of course, being a major one, but also things like oyster reefs and planting of eelgrass. Thank you, Mr. Westerman. Uh, yes, the time was expired. They didn't run the clock until about one minute after you started. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yes, Mr. Carvajal, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Um, and especially to you, Mr. Ford, for your leadership and work on behalf of our National Estuary Program. Um, I'm lucky to be able to represent the Central Coast of California, probably one of the most beautiful districts in California, if not the nation, uh, which includes the Morro Bay Estuary. I say that lightly to not insult the rest of my colleagues, but I think it is the best district in the nation. The National Estuary Program has been immensely helpful to providing environmental restoration and protections to our tributaries and watersheds. Estuaries are also a huge economic driver for tourism dollars and commercial fishing. The Morro Bay Estuary Program alone, off of San Luis Obispo County, had an estimated economic impact of nearly $50 million in the region. Between 2014 and 2015, there were almost 1.5 million visitors to the area with an average of 4,000 visitors a day. As the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee continues to look at the National Estuary Program, what are some of the recommendations that you would propose to maintain or increase the, su the success of this program? And two, why is it critical that we continue to fund and support this very important program? Uh, thank you for the, for the opportunity and the question, sir. Um, I think I think we've we've well explored uh, the, the the value uh, of these systems and, and the importance uh, that they have in the lives of millions of Americans. Um, th that that situation isn't going to change. If anything, there'll just be millions of more Americans relying on these systems. Um, we've we've. Uh, illustrated, I think, through the through the dialogue today, that there are these historical impairments um, to these systems. They are not what they once were. Um, what I recognize is that, and more and more folks that I work with, is that we need to increase the production of these areas. We need to increase the resilience of these areas for them to be able to manage the challenges that they face in the future. Uh, the opportunities to do that. The cost effectiveness of doing that today rather than waiting 10 years or 20 years down the line are real opportunities that really make those dollars um, that we have to spend on these practices effective um, and, and some of the urgency uh, associated with making sure that we, that we don't delay and that we make that move. 
Um, I think uh, on behalf of the, the 28 national estuary programs, um, we, we value the leadership that, that this body has, has demonstrated in the past, and we're just looking for that opportunity to have the re current reauthorization package move through at its full reauthorization, um, because that was a well thought out, good deliberative process. Um, so the, those additional millions um, make a lot of difference for the millions of people that are out there and would make a difference up and down this coast um, and up and down this table. Um, so uh, in, in summary, I'd say that's about where I, where I see it. Are there opportunities to expand the program? Well, certainly there are many estuaries um, in, in the United States of America that are not part of the estuary program. Um, the estuaries of national significance um, are what was the determination and the process that was, was put into place. Um, the lessons that we've learned are being applied elsewhere. Um, there are lessons that we've learned from other folks here um, and model programs that aren't part of the NEP. Uh, but again, I think that, that interest that we have um, and the ability to draw from multiple levels of government and from the private sector and from academia to inform all this help. Um, no doubt, I think that there is plenty of opportunity for the National Estuary Program to become much bigger. Um, I would like to start where it currently exists and then I'd like to see how we could make those expansions happen smartly, um, all of that with concordant funding. And I think the Gulf of Mexico might prove to be the, the n latest testing ground for that in response to the, to the issues and the mitigation associated with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, yield back. Thank you. Mr. Webster. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this. I do. Have, first of all, I have a, uh, uh, some testimony by Dr. Jim uh, Murdaugh, who is the president of Tallahassee Community College in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, I'd like to enter in their record. They've done Not some objection. great things in the area of uh, oyster farming and, uh, and done some awesome things covered in this document. I don't have anyone in particular. Mr. Ford, uh, what is the, what do you think the importance of uh, local government involvement in the cleaning up of estuaries is? The, the importance of having the, the local government involved, I think, is, is that, is, reinforces that buy-in uh, and that the inclusiveness of our local communities in trying to make these things happen. And I think the, the, you know, the top-down uh, perspective uh, or the top-down regulatory approach um, then dilutes what the local community wants to see happen. Um, so when you're standing there with your boots on, standing next to the folks that you live with, and you're looking at a body of water that has these iconic characteristics, and you say, okay, so what should we do here? What do we want to see? You run that back through the mill to make sure that the science that's available to us is informing those, those determinations. And you end up with everybody sitting around the table at the end of the day, I think, going, all right, that sounds like a great path forward, rather than something prescriptive and remote coming down from somewhere else. And I think that for us, that's been the added value of having the local government, the state government, and the local communities involved. Uh, do you think they've um, pulled their weight? I'm sorry, one more time, sir. Do you think they've pulled their weight? Do they, do they pull their weight? They certainly do pull their weight in, in my area, uh, and I can think of numerous examples from, from stories um, and, and communications amongst the other programs that I work with. Um, certainly some regions are able to lead more capably than others, uh, but I, I, I haven't found anybody that's got a local government that's disinterested in having these types of benefits manifest. Anyone else on that issue? Um, yes, if I could add, in Puget Sound, there are a couple of watersheds in King County, so uh, near Seattle, where the local governments have banded together and signed an MOU, Memorandum of Agreement, where they are all contributing funds to fund six staff to create a local plan, and then each of those local governments implements it um, through their land use decisions, through their wastewater treatment decisions. Uh, local government is where the rubber hits the road, so we, we can't do this without them. You think they should do more? Can they do more? Um, <laughs> you know, I have tremendous respect for my local government partners. 
they are sitting in front of um, folks, um, their constituents listening, trying to balance um, mental health issues, homelessness, public safety with the environment. I think they're doing a tremendous job. Um, can we all do more? Yes, and I hope we will. And in San Francisco Bay, we are very um, proud of our, our Measure AA nine county parcel tax. It was really a historic um, measure, first time in the history of the Bay Area where all nine counties uh, came together around one funding measure uh, to, to raise the $25 million uh, a year. Uh, uh, really the first climate adaptation measure uh, locally passed, uh, I think, in the country. So you think they can do more or they've done enough or? The state of California um, has been in investing uh, significantly in the, our, our work. Uh, and again, with complemented with the local money, uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot is being invested at that level. So you think we could just block grant our money and send it to, to you or the others? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. You think we should block grant our money and just send it to, uh, to you or to the locals or through the state? I think the, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of the federal program, of course, is, is, is having a, you know, a guaranteed stream of, of funding which allows you know, the longer term planning uh, process. Uh, you know, we compete for funding through the Army Corps but again, our only guaranteed funding today is the five million from the EPA. So compared to the other watersheds, it's, it's we're very modestly funded. And that ongoing federal funding can, again, really help the planning efforts. Thank you very much. you back. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Ms. Craig, your, your turn. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm proud to hail from Minnesota, where we take our more than 10,000 lakes very, very seriously. Uh, in fact, we've got 11,842 lakes that are more than 10 acres in size. And uh, Mr. Cole, I know why, you know why, why I'm bringing this up here today. Uh, we were recently got a little controversy in Minnesota where Wisconsin claimed to have more lakes than Minnesota. So uh, I, I, I enjoy your uh, cute little ponds in Wisconsin, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, although my district is quite a way from Lake Superior, I'm proud of the work that's been done to restore Minnesota's ecosystems and grow economies along its waterfronts. Um, in your testimony, Mr. Cole, you mentioned the varied positive results of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in both your written and oral testimony. Um, you also voice successes across the larger region. Uh, the GRLI has, uh, represents substantial American investment and elbow grease to get our iconic Great Lakes back to pristine condition. Can you share some key lessons or takeaways about this important initiative uh, that it's brought to light? Thank you for that question. 15,271 cute little lakes in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, key takeaways is, as the regulator uh, in the state of Wisconsin, we begin to use, first of all, common sense regulatory frameworks to address some of the substantive issues that impact local governments, regional governments, and certainly the state. Some of those key takeaways are to leverage that money that you have in recognition that most often that money trickles down to the engineering company, the folks who dredge, but also that the economic impacts that they have in towns like Sheboygan, who's cleaned up their estuary, certainly in Milwaukee where they've cleaned up their estuary, it's a robust economy. Now that you can walk uh, along the boardwalk in Milwaukee and we no longer turn our backs on these estuaries. The local governments have skin in the game from the standpoint they wanna be just like the Chesapeake Bay and some of these other places that we've talked about because they've been successful. They want their piece of the American dream through cleaning up properties and toxic hotspots that still reside in many of these towns. They're driven by environmental protection, but they know they have to pe put their people to work. So the jobs associated with this kind of thing and what we're doing, what the GLR does, is certainly recognition. And the continuation of talking about local level jobs, and that question has been talked about today, jobs, 
jobs, jobs, and the economy around doing this work. Once we reconcile a, a common sense regulatory framework, we roll our sleeves up, and then we just get to work. Yeah. We don't overthink it. We get to work. My responsibility is to remove some of the barriers out of their way and make sure that we can have a collaborative effort. Thank you so much, Mr. Cole. Uh, like to hear a little Midwest common sense, roll up your sleeves and get to work. Uh, the financial benefits of the restoration and where you think um, we can expand those benefits even further if the program is expanded, uh, anything beyond the jobs. Many of us at this table aren't done. We have a lot more work to do. It is, as you heard in my testimony, a significant down payment on reconciling you know, where we still have toxic hotpots. There are still folks in the state of Wisconsin that still have to worry about turning on their water and getting fresh drinking water. We've talked about this being the year of uh, clean, fresh drinking water. You cannot overthink the health implications. Our governor recognizes the health implications of clean, fresh drinking water. And so we have to go that fresh, we have to take our fresh coast and make sure that they continue to provide the safe, fresh drinking water that we all deserve. And that again, we're able to leverage what we do in these toxic hotspots that flow through the rivers into the Great Lakes that we're all subject to human harm if we don't get ahead of it. So we're not done, we still have a lot more work to do and that's where that additional funding, the continued funding will help us. We're just not done. Thank you so much. Um, Madam Chair, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much, Ms. Craig. And now we recognize Mr. Woodall. Yeah, I wanted to focus on the East Coast uh, for a little bit. So Mr. Baker, that focuses uh, on, uh, on you. I was watching your poker face as the chairman was giving his opening remarks. Here you are with 37 years of leadership, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and I believe the chairman's uh, comment was the Chesapeake has made scant progress. Uh, here. Uh, I prefer uh, Mr. Ford's uh, uh, comment that uh, the Chesapeake Bay program is a model uh, program that, uh, that we can learn from, and I appreciated the inclusion in your, uh, in your handout about where we've been from 82 to, to 2018. That's my frustration as a, as a Southeastern uh, Republican. Uh, I don't think anybody plays outside more than I do. I don't think anybody uh, wants natural resources preserved more than I do, uh, but there's this constant drumbeat of you're never doing enough. And yes, we can always do more, uh, to Mr. Webster's uh, point, but we need to celebrate our successes uh, uh, when we have them, because I know uh, uh, if I'm living in a community that's just failure after failure after failure, I'm thinking, what's the point? What's the point of, of doing more? Tell me about that from a Chesapeake Bay Foundation perspective. You led uh, in your uh, comments uh, talking about the importance, you led with the seafood industry. Now, I have a lot of constituents back home in Metro Atlanta who don't know anything about the seafood uh, industry except how good it is uh, uh, to eat, who might assume that because uh, you're leading in an, the environmental preservation and, and improvement uh, side, that you might be at odds uh, with uh, the watermen and the, and the seafood industry. Can you talk to me about that, uh, uh, that partnership, how we really are all in this uh, together? You put a lot on the table, sir. Thank you. <laughs> you, you have three and a half minutes, Mr. Baker. <laughs> First of all, I couldn't agree with you more that people cannot take bad news after bad news after bad news. And when you see progress, you've got to identify it. We in the Chesapeake Bay have had progress. That doesn't mean we're done, obviously. But you know, when you go back 42 years, what I saw in the Bay when I started as an intern at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation was a system that was in fact dying. It is no longer dying. The resilience which has built up in the system makes the scientists believe that even with the hit we took last year with all that rainfall, it may not be anywhere nearly as bad as it would have been. I'll give you one example. There is an enormous area of underwater grasses up near the mouth of the Susquehanna River at the top of the Chesapeake, water, Chesapeake uh, Tidal Bay. That underwater grass bed, even with last year's amount of rain and sediment coming down the Susquehanna River, still had almost crystal clear water in the middle of the grass bed. Around the edges, it was terribly murky, opaque, but in the grass bed, which survived, it still was very clear. The blue crab population, Chesapeake Bay has been called a crab factory by H.L. Mencken, an immense protein factory. 
starting to come back to levels that could be seen as sustainable. Oysters, which are called the coral reefs of an estuary, are being restored, and they're being restored using science as the basis for where it goes, where they should be, where they should be rebuilt. Now, to the commercial fishermen and to those who are working on restoration, of course there's some tension. One example is putting oyster reefs into sanctuary status to let them build back up. The watermen, the commercial fishermen, would like to get in there and harvest them. We understand that. But in the long run, we both see eye to eye that sustainability of fisheries is good for the economy, good for the community, and good for the environment. Well, let's talk about that oysterman issue. Uh, yes, if, I, uh, if I'm uh, counting on, uh, on the water to feed my uh, family, I'd like to be in there every uh, day. I know seasons are going to get longer and, and shorter, uh, but it, as a non-biologist, uh, uh, I would have said rotational harvesting has ecological uh, value. And so now we're, we start to get on the same page, uh, a waterman family and a, and a, and a, uh, a sanctuary uh, family. Is that the experience the Bay is finding? Y yes, it is, and it's being practiced on the Chesapeake Bay, just like rotational grazing for cattle. They, and when we look at those supporters of the Bay, because folks uh, talked about uh, funding uh, streams, and I appreciated the comment, Mr. Pine, that you thought federal funding streams were reliable. Uh, I thought that encouraged me, because I don't hear that all the time uh, uh, back home. Uh, Who's supporting the Chesapeake Bay uh, Foundation? Am I a property owner with, uh, with marsh grass in my front uh, yard? Uh, do I live in the West Virginia mountains and I just want to find a place to vacation? Am I a waterman uh, family who's depending on the next uh, six generations of, of crab harvests uh, to, to keep the family alive? All of the above. 90% of our funding, and we're at about a $25 million organization, is from private citizens and foundations. Every state in the union, we have members in every state in the union. We have 275,000 members across the country, most in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, so it's uh, from young people to older people and everything in between all walks of life. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Marcus uh, Powell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for coming this morning. I think that the most important issue we have facing our nation is clean water. Uh, and I happen to uh, disagree with Congressman Carvajal, who left already, but I think I represent the most beautiful district in the country. I have the beautiful Everglades National Park as part of my district. And as you know, the Everglades provides clean drinking water for about a third of Floridians. And um, we depend on a healthy Everglades. It is necessary for tourism, for our economy, for the fishing industry, for the livelihood of the families that live in that southern area. And um, the water that we receive to the Everglades flows east, west, and south from Lake Okeechobee. And as you can imagine, the quality of the lake, and I'm sure you've all heard, is in such terrible shape that it's filled with phosphorus, nitrogen, other toxins from runoff. Um, then add those very hotter summers that we're seeing, and it's the perfect recipe for cyanobacteria, which leads to disgusting and dangerous algal blooms. And I just wanna remind what we went through to everyone. Last summer, this is what we saw in the coast of Florida. And as a result, we saw thousands of tons of dead fish wash ashore. We've lost dolphins, we've lost manatees. It is um, a situation that we cannot continue to live through and we must find a solution as quickly as possible. So my first question, Mr. Baker, I wanted to see and ask you if reducing the pollution in the water that's already in the Bay, if you've, if you've found any solutions on dealing with the water that's polluted right now in the Bay, and if you can elaborate on that a little bit. Well, nature's remarkably resilient. If you meet her halfway, she will be resilient. So our emphasis and that of the scientists working in the Chesapeake Bay region is to slow the amount of pollution coming in. And for just about every aspect of society, that's saving money because polluting is very expensive. The, the major vector for pollution from agricultural areas, for instance, is topsoil. And you keep topsoil on the farm, you're doing better agronomically. So, while uh, there is some emphasis in certain hot spots for dredging and things like that, the, 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 the cost of that would be so vast 
that really the emphasis has been on reducing uh, future pollution, more pollution, and, and what we're seeing is that nature is bouncing back. And what lessons have you learned from balancing local and federal authorities on dealing with the pollution in the lake? Well, it, you know, it takes a family. Uh, so it really requires local, state, and federal governments to work together with the scientific community. Uh, without that, uh, you're going to miss an important ingredient. So it, it's critical you have all three. And do you think it's appropriate then to give the EPA full regulatory authority? Uh, well, the states have a lot of regulatory authority, and EPA is the umbrella over them. What I mentioned in my oral testimony is that science says the Chesapeake Bay and other bodies, like we're seeing, must be treated as a single system. The state of Maryland can't do anything in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania can't do anything in New York. The federal government is the one jurisdiction which can view and manage the Chesapeake Bay system the way science tells us we must. Okay, thank you, Mr. Baker. Secretary Cole, uh, can you describe in more detail what actions you've taken, what agreements have you reached with regulators and farmers to achieve the significant reduction um, in, in the Great Lakes, which have caused the harmful alg algal blooms? Farmer-led initiatives is a key framework, whether we're in the Green Bay area where New Water, the uh, sewage treatment plant, uh, works with local farmers to create these grassy wasteways, take some of that property out of uh, tillage, and then harvest the phosphorus on the back end and resells the phosphorus pellets. So farmers are, um, as an FFA kid, farmers are often to blame for um, algal blooms. And a lot of it is, whether it's nitrogen that they're putting on for cornfields or a complex mixture of you know, chemicals and ingredients, it's the timing of all of this where they're in the soil protection business. Without the soil, without good quality soil, farmers won't be able to bring their products to market. These generations of uh, farmers that we've entrusted this with in the state of Wisconsin recognize the sheer fact that they can't do what they used to do, that these cover crops in the winter to reduce the soil erosion and the perfect application of the right types of nutrients at the right time is critical to the watershed. So they become champions in terms of, at least in my eyes, in the sheer recognition that they have skin in the game if they want to stay in that business. We celebrated earlier this year, um, earlier this week, the um, Cuyahoga River being caught on fire 50 years ago. And we've come a long way, baby. Wasn't that an uh, ad back in the day? We've come a long way, and we have. But the sheer recognition with the farming community in the state of Wisconsin is awesome. And that's what we've learned over time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Mr. Cole. The chair now recognizes Mr. Babin for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate all the witnesses being here. Um, Thank you for your expertise. Uh, this will be to the whole panel, and if you could keep your answers short, I would appreciate it. I have the distinct pleasure of representing uh, Southeast Texas uh, from Houston, Louisiana, including the estuary, uh, estuarine waters of Galveston Bay and, and Sabine Lake. Uh, this is where I've lived my entire life. Born and raised down there, I remember well when excessive pollutants were deterrents from enjoying many of the great outdoor advantages that are home to Southeast Texas. But over the years, we have made great strides in restoring our land and water in the area, allowing so many, including my own children and grandchildren, uh, to enjoy the fishing and hunting and hiking and boating that are available to us there. Making these uh, sorts of outdoor activities possible are the National Estuary Program, such as the Galveston Bay Estuary Program. And as a matter of fact, the Galveston Bay Estuary Program is, is headquartered in my district in uh, Clear Lake. But some of the many other projects that I am proud to have in my district include Armand Bio, uh, Marsh Mania, Guardy Marsh Conservation Project, Turtle Bayou, uh, Shipe Woods Habitat Protection, and Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge uh, entrance. Uh, these projects have been collaborative, non-over-regulative successes that have continued to showcase the environmental beauty of Southeast Texas. With that being said, no government-run program is perfect. 
at least I haven't found one yet. How can we improve upon the National Estuaries Program? In a short, we'll start down here, uh, Mr. Cole. Well, again, the, 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 the short answer is collaborate, 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 leverage the money at the local, state, federal level, partners in the room, sheer recognition of, continued recognition of that we're not done, there's a lot more work to do. Um, again, the leveraging part of using federal dollars and key partners in this, that share vision moving forward, TINSA has worked in Wisconsin for a long time. Thank you very much. Mr. Pine. I would agree that the collaboration is, is critical and the investment of those federal dollars uh, will be leveraged tremendously. So it, particularly in the Bay Area, uh, th those dollars are, 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 are very much in need. Thank you. Ms. Blackmore. I agree with my colleagues, and also I would add, I believe the current House Appropriations Bill includes an increase in funding for each of the National Estuary Programs, which would be very, very welcome, as well as uh, the creation of a competitive grant program. So those of us with projects that we're really excited about can apply for that, um, and you can uh, direct funding to the, to the places that it's most needed. Thank you. All of my mother's side of the family is from Houston. And I helped uh, get the Galveston Bay Foundation started. They've doing, they're doing great work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks for to your, her. Thank you for your support. Uh, my simple answer is science. Uh, make sure science is at the table. And where sometimes scientists will disagree, bring them together. Tell them to hash it out and give, you, give the best recommendation they can come up with. That's good. I'd, I'd like to also add that I was, used to work for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department between uh, college years. I was... A uh, wildlife technician and worked in inland and uh, marine fisheries, both. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, the Lake Pontchartrain region is actually not part of the National Estuary Program, although we do function very similarly to one. So, we partner with not only the state government, but also local governments, and it's just important that we collaborate, as my colleagues have mentioned, and I'd also like to uh, reiterate what Mr. Baker mentioned about science. Our organization is grounded in science, and integrity in science is everything we do. Right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Ford. Yes, sir. Um, I think the, the additional aspect that, that really comes to my mind is, is the effectiveness of communication. And I think Mr. Woodall brought that up, um, that, you know, hey, yeah, it sounds like things are great. Well, they're not that great. Um, well, how do I evaluate that? Uh, I work with people where some algae is good and other algae is bad or too much algae, or the algae in the wrong place. So uh, our ability to effectively communicate, manage these partnerships collaboratively, make sure that that science is nested in that communication is key element in our success. And it's one of those places where I think we could all do some more work. Thank you. I don't have much time left, but just talking about the, the money, the science, uh, the partnerships moving forward, do you believe that we can create and incentivize more public-private partnerships that will allow us to be responsible stewards of this land and the taxpayer's dollar? Uh, and why should someone, say, from Iowa uh, be footing the bill for land and water conservation in Texas? Would somebody like to take a stab at that before our time runs out? Which it already has, but we can get somebody want to take a stab at that? Sure. Go ahead, Mr. Baker. A, a quick stab. The answer is yes. Okay. But you know, ask the, the folk in Iowa, uh, did they like the, uh, the seafood that comes out of the uh, Galveston Bay? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, the chair, uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes, and I want to thank this excellent panel. It's great to hear witnesses from some of the great estuaries uh, around our country and the communities that depend on them. We uh, know, and we're being reminded today, that estuaries provide a wide range of ecosystem services. Those of us in the San Francisco Bay Area, welcome, Supervisor. Uh, we get that. We uh, take great pride in our outdoor recreation, our commercial and recreational fishing, as well as the benefits of coastal resiliency uh, that our wetlands provide, buffers against rising sea levels. And uh, let's not forget also the role of blue carbon, the uh, potential for healthy wetlands to help sequester the carbon emissions that are imperiling our planet. So lots to consider here. Supervisor uh, Pine, thanks especially to you for coming out and helping talk about the importance of San Francisco Bay as an estuary that is truly of national importance. In your testimony, you discussed the important role that our bay provides to waterfowl in the Pacific Flyway. Of course, our iconic uh, California salmonid species, Dungeness crab. Um, 
Species like salmon are not just iconic for California, though, and we need to remind people that. They are truly West Coast wide, and I appreciate the testimony of Ms. Blackmore uh, reminding us about the importance of, uh, that salmon provide to the declining orca population. And uh, so there are many reasons to work together to protect these resources. Uh, Californians, uh, I think, definitely recognize the importance of San Francisco Bay, and that's why in 2016, the nine Bay Area counties came together, actually taxed themselves, passed Measure AA to support climate adaptation and restoration funding. And Supervisor Pine, I wanted to ask you to just speak a little more about that. I think it's important that members of Congress know that the federal support that this estuary provides a place like San Francisco Bay uh, is matched many times over uh, with really unique and, and important local support. Could you speak to that, please? I, I'd be happy to. Um, the uh, major AA process really started with the creation of uh, what's called the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority in, in 2008. And it's a, a special district encompassing all the bay. And we were chartered um, with the, the task of finding a local funding mechanism to accelerate uh, bay restoration. So between 2008 and 2016, um, well, we looked at a variety of, of, of approaches and uh, waited for the economy to approve, and then uh, went forward across all nine counties with a $12 parcel tax for every, uh, every parcel in the Bay Area. And the uh, effort had a remarkable um, coalition behind it, uh, with uh, strong backing from the business community, who of course recognized the flood protection elements uh, of restoration, strong backing from uh, labor, strong backing from uh, the environmental community. And uh, when we polled, we, we found that uh, our residents care deeply about the Bay and its ecosystem and want to be sure it's passed on to the next generation in a better place than it is today. So uh, a 70% uh, positive vote was a remarkable outcome. And uh, we've had two rounds of grant funding through the um, uh, through Measure AA that have kicked off or helped supplement 13 different projects uh, and is really a linchpin of our uh, restoration efforts now. Um, yeah, 70 percent support is, is remarkable. I mean, just the fact that these counties all did come together to tax themselves is impressive, but that level of support really speaks to um, the, the imperative that the people of the Bay Area see uh, to protect the Bay. And obviously, uh, we've done some harmful things to the San Francisco Bay Estuary over the years, going all the way back to the gold rush, but certainly including the dam building um, period of the, the previous century and the, the loss of sediments. Uh, I know one of the uh, imperatives that were, was on the mind of voters was the fact the uh, projections that we may be only a decade away from losing many of the salt marshes and mudflats that make up the bay. Um, can, can you speak to that and, and how that played yeah, into that, the minds of voters? That, that's a, that is a, a big concern because with uh, sea level rise uh, accelerating, we do run the risk of, of losing the opportunities to do this to do this restoration. Well, the last thing you want, the San Francisco Bay is just surrounded by gray infrastructure and, and flood walls. Um, the former salt ponds, uh, which of course were uh, you know a very industrial use, were really kind of a blessing in disguise because the, the land is at least there to be restored. Uh, but if, if, we, if we don't act, uh, those, those lands will be flooded. Thank you, Supervisor. In my final few seconds, I want to just uh, say how proud I am to be a co-sponsor of Congresswoman Jackie Spears' bill. You mentioned it earlier, H.R. 1132, establishing authorization of $25 million a year annually for EPA grants to Bay Conservation and Restoration. I hope that's something that we can work on together in this Congress. And with that, I will yield, and who are we recognizing? And Mr. Garamendi is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, or Acting Chair. I'd, I'd want to uh, just really commend all of you for the work you do. It's extremely important. Back in the 90s, when I was at the Department of Interior, we started working on the Everglades program. Not there yet. Working on the Chesapeake program. Not there yet. San Francisco Bay and on and on. Uh, the NEP is extremely important. The support of the federal government uh, is critical here. Much of this started with the Clean Water Act, foundational. And some states were ahead of it. Other states followed along after the Clean Water Act went in, in place, providing the foundational law 
for cleaning up our estuaries and our rivers, uh, and we got more to do. Uh, I noticed that this uh, particular uh, NEP expires on the 20, uh, 2021. I would hope that we have a reauthorization effort this year so that uh, by the end of 20, uh, we're ready to go. And I suspect all of you support that. Uh, you can nod your heads yes. I noticed you all nodding. Uh, there's more to do. The role of the federal government here is critically important. It provides the foundation. It also provides support in many, many different ways. Uh, not just with uh, the small amount of funding in the, uh, in, in the estuary program, but with all of the other programs. Uh, I think it was, um, I forget which one of you were talking about the length of time that it takes. Uh, Mr. Ford, I believe you were the one talking about the length of time it takes to get a project underway. And uh, you want to claim credit for that comment, Mr. Pine? That's fine. Uh, but it does take forever, and the coordination between the various agencies the, uh, is really something we need to work on here uh, and to pull that together. I would really appreciate your specific suggestions on how that might be done. So let's run quickly through uh, right to left, my right to your left. That'd be you, Mr. Ford, first. Thank you for the work you've done on Santa Monica Bay. Thank you, sir. I've been involved in that for more than 40 years myself, so let's go. All right. Um, How do we coordinate? What do we need to do? Yeah, so I, I think uh, what, what we're able to provide now, and arguably with continued support, we'd be able to continue to provide it and, and increase it, uh, which is simply that we get folks working together on the ground early so that when these projects manifest, they're, they're, they're not a surprise. Um, I, I've certainly heard uh, from various leadership in the state of California or, or here in, in the district uh, of trying to figure out how to help you know, streamline and fast track some of these programs um, that have these environmental benefits uh, because we need them and we need them now. Um, so I think there's plenty of opportunity to explore it. Early on, get together early. Uh, thank you for this great question. I think um, we have a lot of great work that goes on and it's continuous. You know, as I've mentioned, we've been around for 30 years and a lot of the uh, decisions that we make is driven by the data that we have collected continuously for 30 years. And so it's really important for us to maintain that continuous data set to drive smart decisions. And so to keep this program going and to ensure that that funding continues, you know, on a regular basis would really help us to continue that science-driven work. On the Chesapeake, there's something called the Executive Council, which meets annually. The governors of all six states, the mayor of the District of Columbia, and the federal lead agency, EPA bringing the leadership together to discuss and decide and plan how to move forward new projects, I think has been critical for us, and I would suggest it's a good model. The National Estuary Program requires us to pull together the federal government, the state government, local government, tribes, the agricultural community, environmental yeah. community, business community. We do that now. Um, in, in all 28. Um, You're doing, excuse me, I'm going to interrupt for almost oh, out of time here. You're doing it. Do we need to go into the various federal agencies that are involved, Corps of Engineers, EPA, so forth, and require them to coordinate with the local agencies? Uh, it's a great question, and actually in Puget Sound, so um, Congressman Heck and Kilmer have introduced um, H.R. 2247, the Puget SOS Act, which would create, require the creation of a federal task force with, and, the, and a program office at EPA. And that would help coordinate, bring them together, hold them accountable, require all the federal agencies to work together to create their own action plan working with us. Congressman uh, Garamendi, in the Bay Area, you know, we have um, taken this uh, challenge on in earnest in creating what we've called the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team where we're requiring the and, and helping to fund the, the regulators to look at our applications in a more comprehensive and, and collaborative way. I'm gonna, and I'm we gonna put in place uh, timelines. Time, so excuse me for interrupting. The question is really one directed to the federal government and to a federal law or requirement that the federal agencies must coordinate and come together on early on in an issue, uh, whatever that issue might be. And I'd like to hear from all of you with a little memo uh, following up on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. 
Um, I believe we will go into a brief second round of questions, if you don't mind. Um, and I guess I will start off with uh, uh, all of you. If Congress doesn't reauthorize the program and increase funding for the program, will our coast suffer? And uh, will you enjoy economic growth? Uh, will you be able to restore the, uh, those areas uh, for many of you? Chesapeake Bay is not part of the National Estuary Program. It was really the model that the NEP was formed based on. But um, we're, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Congressman Elaine Luria for introducing legislation to restore the authorization for the Chesapeake Bay Program. And I might also just mention one notion. Estuaries are the first line of defense for the impacts of climate change on coastal areas. But they don't believe in climate change. Just if you are concerned about increased storms, sea level rise, warmer water, estuaries are the first line of defense. Call it whatever. Um, estuaries are too important not to protect for the benefit of people living in coastal areas. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I may, and Will said it earlier, uh, the glue is, is much what a lot of this funding provides. Um, and I have no doubt um, that our estuaries of national significance amongst those 28 programs that are out there working day in, day out, if this funding were to go away, they would be greatly diminished. Um, and the services that they provide um, would also be greatly diminished. We think we have a model program in Wisconsin. We get to go back and tell the Wisconsinites that we have a partnership with the federal government. They care about clean drinking water. They know that adaptation is important for climate change, that they recognize that people in Wisconsin often have challenges turning on their drinking water to get clean drinking water. Economic development aside, the human health implications about what we're doing with this funding is part and parcel to saving babies' lives, saving communities, and reducing the harm. So our commercial for Governor Evers and I is that Congress gets it, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a problem sometimes, and I've heard that uh, topsoil has been part of the problem, contamination. Uh, is there a problem with uh, the farmers or the agricultural industri industry not participating or being slow in participating in cleanup? I've, certain, I've certainly gone on record uh, to say that farmers in the state of Wisconsin are part of the heavy lift in changing their own practices right. to preserve the soil that is already there, beginning to use cover crops and using different management practices to reduce harm in our estuaries. Good. In Puget Sound, we're working on uh, a really interesting initiative called Floodplains by Design, where we work with the farm community, the flood community, and the um, salmon habitat community to come up with projects that actually benefit all three. So we're reducing flood risk, improving salmon habitat, and maintaining sustainable working lands at the same time. So farmers have definitely been part of the solution. In, in the Bay Area, the, the farming is not really the issue, but storm runoff is a significant concern. So we're in, investing in, in considerable you know, green infrastructure to retain and, and allow waters to uh, go back into the ground uh, before they reach the Bay uh, to reduce the pollutants. Thank you. Uh, in South Louisiana, in the Pontchartrain Basin, uh, we are the recipient of the uh, waters from 41% of the United States, and a lot of that is America's heartland and the farming country. And we can't achieve any successes without the cooperation of farmers. We've seen great successes. It's come a long way over the past several years, and especially in South Louisiana, we have a great, great working relationship with the farmers in South Louisiana. We have a lot of dairy farms in our basin, and we haven't been able to achieve those successes without their cooperation. So we really appreciate their support. Great. Anybody else? Cut. Farmers put a lot of their own money into conservation, but they need technical assistance and they need cost share dollars. Are they getting it? And they are getting much of it through the federal farm bill, the conservation article, critically important for Congress to continue that conservation funding in the farm bill. So farmers want to do the right thing. They like municipalities and even corporations need some help 
in getting the job done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Wisterman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be brief here. Well, I talked in the last uh, set of questions about how I'm a, an engineer, but I'm also a, a forester, maybe the more gentle side of me. But uh, I think we face a lot of similar issues across the spectrum in, in managing our natural resources. You know, it's often been said that forests are the lungs of the earth, but a lot of people don't realize they're also kind of the kidneys of the earth. They do a lot to uh, clean water and protect estuaries and, uh, and waterways. Uh, most of our drinking water in this country comes from a forest, and I get frustrated sometimes working on the forestry side of it on how do we streamline the management of our forest so that we get cleaner air and cleaner water. And Mr. Pine, I noticed in your testimony, you felt some of this frustration as well. You, you said that you talked about the time consuming and expensive permitting process is a significant hurdle to accelerating the pace and scale of wetlands restoration in San Francisco Bay. You talked about forming that um, Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team to expedite permitting for wetland restoration projects. It seems like sometimes we trip over our own feet um, we we know the right thing to do, and we we put obstacles in our way uh, to, that keep us from doing the right thing. Um, would you like to comment on that more about what we can do to streamline the process? And does anybody else have uh, issues in their area where the permitting process sometimes gets in the way of doing uh, the good work that you're all trying to do? Yes, we are just uh, kicking off this new uh, regulatory integration effort, and have uh, high hopes for it. Um, it has been discouraging because when we are working on this, re this restoration work, and we're, we're doing a project for the, for the benefit of the environment, and then to see the process sometimes take three, three years is, uh, is, is, is definitely concerning. Um, and each of the agencies, you know, has important missions and important goals, uh, but the, the lack of coordination and the, the lack of... Uh, uh, you know, kind of early involvement in some of the applications, you know, has led to these delays. And uh, uh, we are hopeful that this will be a model that other areas in the country can, can, can look to. Now, we are actually providing funding for this staff um, uh, so that they will be dedicated to these projects and they will follow certain rules and procedures that have been agreed to. Um, so it's not without an incremental cost, but we think that cost is warranted given that... Um, uh, the, the delays that have been caused are, are, are causing us to fall behind and causing our projects to cost more. In Puget Sound, the federal agencies are working together to streamline permitting for shoreline restoration projects, particularly for um, shoreline property owners, landowners who have a seawall or a bulkhead. You know, we want them to take those out and replace it with green shoreline infrastructure, um, but the permitting process is incredibly expensive and time-consuming and discouraging for them. So the EPA, NOAA, and the Corps are working together on that right now in Puget Sound. And I would, I would submit that, uh, again, the local, state, federal angles on this, and Mr. Garamendi can, can speak to this from his leadership when he was in Sacramento, uh, that the state of California's response to much of this was the formation of the Ocean Protection Council to bring together some of the lead agencies within the state so that they were in harmony on their priorities to make these processes move through uh, the systems much faster. So uh, elements like that, in conjunction with what I just heard from Laura, are, are, are heartening. And I think that they're a very good roadmap forward. Um, you know, time is money. Um, whether it's regulatory permitting for wetlands, we have statutory timelines to meet. It's open and it's clear. We have dual authority with the U.S. Corps in the permitting process. So it's one-stop shopping in the state of Wisconsin. When you're trying to get projects done, it's open, it's clear. And if we don't meet those timelines, then we're held accountable. It can be hiccups, but that's when we, again, all roll up our sleeves and see where the problems uh, exist. And quite often, it's just the early stages of not having enough information to fulfill the permit. And so we won't start the clock until they have everything ready for us. And I, I... I'm glad that it's not just the, the forestry world that suffers in the uh, regulatory burden sometimes and other parts of uh, you know, environmental work and restoration where 
the, the well-intended guidelines often become an impediment to doing the good work. I hope, hope we can learn lessons from that as we work on policy to uh, come up with policy that actually allows good things to happen on the ground and doesn't delay it costing time, doesn't uh, you know, become a hurdle within itself. You have to be quick. As a, as a uh, Missouri-trained forester, the state of Wisconsin performs the timber sales on behalf of the Shawamigan and the Nicolay to get past the uh, burdensome bureaucracy associated with timber sales in the state of Wisconsin. So the mills are humming in the state of Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Marika Silpaul. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for granting me a few more moments here since I, I truly believe this is one of the most important issues facing our country. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Baker, you had mentioned in your testimony that the health of the Chesapeake Bay saw a setback in 2018 due to the extraordinary rains and the associated polluted runoff that contaminated the bay. We saw the same thing in Lake Luchobi after Hurricane Irma. Uh, but it seems that 2019 is in many ways following that same pattern that we saw in 2018 in precipitation. So how can we continue to make the Bay more resilient to the changes in climate and extreme weather events that seem to be happening with more regularity and yet continue to make progress in improving the overall health of the Bay and other areas like Lake Okeechobee as well? You don't give up. <laughs> it's this simple answer, and I, I don't mean to be glib, but that's it. You, you, we are nowhere near the end. We have to keep working. One interesting thing in this region about 19, uh, 2018, we had double the amount of rain, but in significantly less number of storms. Do the math. That means the storms were far more intense. Nature uh, abhors extremes. That was adding to the impact as well. We are seeing a lot of rain this year, but it's not coming in quite the same intensity. So I like to keep my fingers crossed, and um, I'm an optimist by heart. <laughs> Good. Me too. That's why I'm here, if not. Um, and uh, one, one last question. You mentioned the role of wetlands in protecting our communities from climate change. Uh, but as you know, wetlands are also threatened by sea level rise, and we've seen that in South Florida. What role can the federal government play in protecting and restoring our wetlands through programs like the Chesapeake Bay Program or other regulatory efforts? Well, I think the chairwoman talked about blue carbon. Wetlands are incredibly important for any number of reasons. You know, we've got a lot of areas to develop, and we just have got to stop destroying wetlands. Uh, the concept of mitigating destruction two to one, three to one, with man-made wetlands, human-made wetlands, just doesn't work anywhere near as well as the original wetland. Only other last thought is that wetlands with sea level rise can be destroyed. They need room to migrate inland. That has happened throughout the millennia, but very slowly. Now it's happening much more quickly, and that's a critical need to allow wetlands to migrate inland as the seas rise. Thank you so much. I yield back my time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I want to continue on what I was talking about earlier, and that has to do with the way in which we uh, regulate or don't at the federal level the need to uh, pull together the various federal agencies so that they're all working together early on in the process. Just for a heads up, the uh, U.S. Uh, military has a lot of bases around. They're required by law to uh, reach out to the Native American communities, which they usually do at the end of the process, which then creates lawsuits and uh, other kinds of delays. So I'm looking at ways in which we can have the federal government engage earlier in a coordinated way. Uh, I ran out of time last time, so if you could come back with your best ideas about how that could be done across the board, Army Corps of Engineers, military, EPA, and the like. Uh, also, um, one of you uh, early on in your testimony uh, indicated the length of time it takes to process any application. Uh, unfortunately, right now it's a five-year um, period of time that an applicant, once approved, uh, stands. We're looking at extending that to a 10-year period of time. So if you are able to obtain a permit, 
uh, you, that permit is good for 10 years, considering that it takes five years just to get started on the next project. And so we're looking at that. I draw that to the attention of the committee and uh, for your um, um, review of it. And if you like it, let us know. We're we hope to move that. Also, we would hope that we could um, authorize, reauthorize the NEP this year, uh, at least no later than next year, so that in 2021 arrives, we're good to go and more money. So uh, just a couple of uh, questions for you that you might want to respond to. Um, how could we better coordinate? I think I ended, I cut you off. Fujin, uh, Puget Sound got cut off in the middle of that. We never got to uh, San Francisco or beyond, so. Sure, uh, so uh, H.R. 2247, introduced by Congressman Heck and Kilmer, includes an idea, I think, aimed at exactly what you're saying, sir. Uh, it would require the creation of a federal task force that includes the military, as well as EPA, NOAA, the Corps, the usual suspects. Um, requires them to come together, create an action plan, working with us, the state, and with our tribes, early in the process to identify actions that the federal government will undertake. Um, and it also requires uh, regular reporting on their progress and outcomes. So I, I'm very excited about that possibility. I think that was done early on in the, the Everglades, like in the 1990s, that task force. Oh, really? Force. Okay, yeah. But that would apply across the nation or just for Puget this, Sound? This bill just applies to Puget Sound, but I could imagine it having benefit across the nation. Well, let's back to San Francisco. Yes, so I've had an opportunity to, to, to talk about our uh, regulatory integration team, and just to make one further further point there, you, you know, what, what we of course often see is that um, the regulators have timelines, but those timelines commence when the um, application is deemed quote unquote complete. And uh, often uh, that's where the delay occurs with back and forth until that completion is deemed uh, 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 ready. So uh, in, our, in, our, in our new efforts, uh, you know, we are uh, hoping the regulators will, will, will work to make sure the application is complete to get those clocks running. And we're putting timelines in place that measure uh, performance from the submission of the application, not necessarily from the, the date of completion. So I think that, that's, that's a, a, an area where we wanna see improvement. As, as I mentioned earlier, we have some dual responsibilities as it relates to permitting. Um, the state of Wisconsin and the U.S. Corps, uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers have a dual permitting process, so it's one-stop shopping. When you put your permit in, we act as the agent and coordinate with uh, the U.S. Uh, Corps of Engineers. Um, EPA in our region is in Chicago. We hold quarterly meetings on enforcement issues related to actions that we're taking, actions that they're taking, whether they're in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and so we uh, collaborate. I'm, I'm blessed to have the previous secretary for the DNR being the regional administrator in Chicago for the EPA. So we spend a lot of time having conversations as well. Another thing I draw the attention to is the a nationwide process rather than a regional Corps of Engineer issue here is really important, particularly with regard to Native American sites there be a nationwide uh, program. Uh, that is in, that was in process, it's now been delayed. We'll see if we can move that along. Uh, thank you very much. Draw your attention once again to HR 1764 that extends the deadline or the, the permit from five to 10 years. Thank you very much, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Lowenthal, would you have any additional questions, sir? <laughs> Mr. Pine, uh, first I want to congratulate the uh, San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority on its selection as one of the 10 pilot projects for the beneficial use or beneficial reuse of dredge materials by the U.S. Army Corps in, I believe it was December of 2018. Um, I understand that since the gold rush, 
San Francisco Bay has lost over 90% of its wetlands due to development, but that this pilot project is part of a larger regional effort to restore thousands of acres of wetlands and aquatic habitat. Can you expand on this initiative and tell us how your region has been able to forge a multi-agency partnership to restore these tidal wetlands? It'd be very informative. One of, yes, I'd be uh, happy to. One of the big challenges we face in restoring wetlands is finding um, sufficient uh, set of, uh, dirt and mud to build up former agricultural lands or former salt um, production lands which over time have, have subsided. So in order to restore them, tremendous amounts of soil need to be brought in. And uh, the beneficial reuse of dredge materials will uh, be uh, uh, critical if we are to restore the, uh, the properties that we, we want to. Historically, oftentimes, those materials were brought out under the Golden Gate and dumped uh, in the ocean. Um, so under this pilot program, um, we are trying to change the direction towards uh, the reuse and restoration. One, one challenge we face is, although we are one of the pilots as, as the other nine, is uh, the, the funding from the U.S. Army Corps has, um, uh, you know, not yet uh, emerged to make those, to fund those pilots, and that's something that needs to uh, yet to be straightened out. But uh, we, we desperately need the beneficial reuse of dredge material. Well, I think it's great that you're doing it, and I can just imagine how that can be used. Recently, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I spent a weekend with uh, Congressman Graves from Louisiana. I don't think Congressman is here, and from southern Louisiana on the really importance also of the using the sediment that comes down from the Mississippi to, because they've lost thousands and thousands of acres. And so we, he showed me what was going on. And so, I, so my question is, how come it's taken so long and what's been the Army Corps' issue? Why are we talking about a pilot project rather than a regular project? And what has happened in the past? The, the Army Corps has always taken the view that it's more... Uh, 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 less expensive and more economical to simply dump the materials in, in the ocean. But uh, that's really not correct when you think about the project as a whole. I mean, to bring in those soils from uh, uh, land-based sources is extraordinarily expensive. So it's really uh, been an argument with the Corps about the uh, economics of the reuse of dredge material. Does anyone else want to comment on this, this the use, reuse, beneficial reuse, and what some of the issues are? If so, not, uh, very very quickly, sir. Uh, for us uh, in our region, the the Los Angeles River, um, and the yes. as you are very familiar with. Very very. Um, I'm the receiving end. Yes, you are. Lack of receiving end. Um, so the, the the very good news uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers is that the sediment sampling um, in the Los Angeles Long Beach Harbor, um, due to the sequest to getting rid of the pollutant loading is that those sediments are now approaching to a point where they could be beneficially reused. Okay, um, so, so the obstacle that we found in the past was that, yes, the water was polluted, the sediments were polluted, and so there was very few options with what to do with the sediment. Um, we certainly need it. We need to put it in smart places. Um, and at this point in time, because of all the work we've done, we're approaching uh, sediments that are clean enough to do that work. Thank you. Yes. Um, Mr. Lowenthal, I'm with the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation in South Louisiana, so we were happy to host you on your visit to South Louisiana to see some of the amazing projects we have. And they are amazing. Yes, yes, and so we view the Mississippi River as a tool, um, and we look forward to being able to use that sediment to rebuild our wetlands. And of course, we're dependent upon that permitting process to be expedited, get those sediment diversion projects constructed so that we can restore our coast. I'm just so glad to hear have this discussion about the beneficial reuse I think it's just critically, critically important, and I know it's been a difficult issue to deal with in the past, but because of all the work, both the one I'm aware of in L.A. County and cleaning up and the permitting that has kept the dumping out and the cleaning of our water, of our waterway and uh, uh, the, the working with the Army Corps now uh, to begin to figure out how do we use this beneficial reuse, and it is a beneficial reuse, critically important. And with that, I thank the chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. 
Uh, it's uh, funny that you mentioned the Army Corps. I understand the Brigadier General <coughs> is going to be in charge of the Mississippi River uh, in total, so maybe we could schedule a meeting to be able to give him our concerns over the dredging material and, and other things. Uh, with that, um, I'm starting to close. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any of the questions that may be submitted to them in writing. And unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record for today's hearing. And without objection, so ordered. And I'd like to very thankfully uh, say thank you to all of you to being here so long and for providing testimony to this uh, uh, panel, I mean, to this uh, committee. And uh, if no other members have anything to add, the committee stands adjourned. Get my foot out of my mouth.